I want you to know that the children's sermon at the 8.30 service, I said, have you ever had to do something that you don't want to do? And one little boy said, yeah, I didn't want to come to church today. <laughs> and I thought, you're probably not the only one, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> have you ever um, been in a situation where all of a sudden you find yourself just absolutely angry? And you're filled with righteous indignation and you say things and you wish you could take them back and you realize later how angry you were. Anybody ever have that happen to them? Yeah, it happened to me on Thursday. Yes. And I want to tell you about my experience with this. Um, My my wife, Becca, and I, we joined a new gym and uh, and it's it's on 410 close to I-10 and it's really far away from our house. And the class that we wanted to take is at 615 in the evening which means rush hour traffic to go to this gym. Um, And so we're doing this back and forth, and we're learning some new things, and we're having a good time doing this. On Thursday, she comes home from school, and she's really not feeling well, and she's she's sick. She's even homesick right now. Um, And uh, and so she said, but you you go ahead and go. So I was like, okay. So I get into my car, and I'm leaving, and it's a little before 530, because I know it's going to take me forever because of rush hour traffic. And I'm driving, and I'm just cruising along, and and, uh, I'm listening to music, and the traffic's not bothering me. I mean, I'm just perfectly fine, you know, going to this gym, going to go work out and stuff. And and, uh, I pull up, and it's 613. And the class starts at 6.15. I'm like, sweet, I made it, you know? And I get my little key fob, and I walk in, and the woman behind the counter, I hold my key fob up to sign in, and she goes, which class are you here for? And I tell her, the 6.15 class. And she goes, I'm so sorry, it started at 6. And I turn around, and I can see everybody behind the window already working out. And I'm like, well, that's okay. I'll I'll just jump in, and I'll just join. She goes, sir, I'm sorry. We have a strict policy that after 10 minutes, no one's allowed in. And for some reason... That lit a fuse in me, and I exploded on this woman. I just drove 45 minutes in traffic. What do you mean I can't go in there? And she starts to say, sir, excuse me. And then I just stormed out of that place. And I was so angry, and I was mad. I was mad. And I drove home angry, and I'm very happy that I didn't get in an accident as I drove home. I walked into the house angry. My oldest had a bad day talking to my sick wife, and they were commiserating, and I didn't care. I was mad. And I'm making my scrambled eggs, and I scrambled the tar out of those eggs. (laughs) And I ate my dinner mad, and I went upstairs, and I laid down in bed, and I was still angry, and that's when it hit me. I am Jonah. I am so much like Jonah. I realized I was, I was mad that I was mad that I was mad, and I got caught up in that cycle, and then I could see what I had done, and I was, oh, oh no. I'll get back to that in a minute. <laughs> Jonah is a fantastic book in our Bible. It's part of the minor prophets. There are In the Hebrew Bible, there are 12 minor prophets. Jonah comes out at number five, but one of these prophets is doing their own thing, Okay. All the other prophets are stories about how God uses these people as spokespersons to bring people closer to God. They would go and they would speak the word of God to other people and they would listen to them. They would be things like return to the Lord your God. Uh, People that are in the exile, they would be words of hope that they would come back to, to follow God and to come back in line with that, to return back to faith. And people would, and it was this, these were hopeful messages and stuff, but Jonah is this outlier. It's a satire. It's a comedy. It is absurd at best. And Jonah speaks the word that God asked him to speak reluctantly, uh, almost doesn't do it, and fights it the whole way, and he does the bare minimum. And you all already know the whole story, but I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version real quick. God looks at Jonah and says, would you go to Nineveh and... Tell them to repent from their wicked ways. They're evil people. Would you go in and tell them? And Jonah doesn't want to, but he says, okay, and immediately turns around and walks the other direction. And he goes to Tarshish, and he climbs onto a boat, and he says, take me anywhere but Nineveh. And the sailors take him out, and all of a sudden on the water, it starts getting rocky, and there's water that's all over the place, and there's storms that are hitting, and the, and the, and the ship's going to sink. And the sailors start throwing things overboard. They're praying to whatever God they can get their hands on. And Jonah, who's been asleep on the boat the whole time, comes up and says, guys, it's probably my fault. I'm Hebrew. God's mad. You should throw me overboard. And they're like, oh, no, we can't do that, Jonah. We, they keep trying to force it to get it through there. And finally, they realize, I guess we need to throw him overboard. And they chunk Jonah over the boat. He lands in the water, and it's quiet. And he's like, told you so. 
you know, and there's Jonah bobbing up and down, and then what happens next? He gets swallowed by a giant fish. I know what you're thinking. It's a whale. Read the scripture. It's just a fish. It doesn't matter. It's absurd. A giant animal swallows up this man, and he lives in the belly for three days? Are there other stories about being closed off for three days in the Bible? Yes, there are. This is an interesting tale that's happening here. It's a whale of a tale. Yes. Jonah's inside the belly of this fish, and he starts to pray, release me, free me. I'll do what you're asking me to do. I'm sorry, God. I repent, kind of. And then this fish spits Noah out, or Noah, Jonah, spits Jonah out onto the shores of Nineveh, which, by the way, there are no shores because Nineveh is a landlocked place. So Nineveh, it says in our scripture, is a three-day walk across. How far does Jonah walk? Anybody remember what scripture said? One day. So he's not even going to go all the way into town, is he? No, he kind of walks a little bit, and he's like, far enough, whatever. <laughs> and then in the Hebrew, he says five words. And the way it's translated is, 40 days more, and Nineveh will be overthrown. <sighs> and he leaves. He doesn't mention God. He doesn't tell them to repent. He doesn't tell them to do anything. He goes, and he says this simple message not even all the way into town, and then he leaves to go climb up on a cliff and watch the destruction happen because that's what he wants to have happen to these people. But the people listened to what he said, and all of a sudden they started to turn toward Yahweh, turn toward God. And the king got word of this, and he started to repent, and they started to put on sackcloth, and they started to put ashes on top, and they were even getting the animals to follow suit with this, and everybody repented. And Jonah's up there watching all this stuff happening, and he's like, I can't win. I can't, I, can't, I can't believe this is happening. God, you've got to be kidding me. I'm so angry. I could die. And so then God creates this bush to wrap around Jonah so that way he has some shade in the scorching sun. And Jonah's like, thanks. And then a worm comes and eats the bush away. And then Jonah's sitting there in the scorching sun. And he's like, I can't believe you do this, God. Just kill me now. And God looks at him and he says, if you care so much about the bush, why don't you care for these people? They don't know their right hand from their left but they're my people, and I can do what I want with them. Should I not care for them? And then the story ends. Jonah did not get his way, and he threw his own temper tantrum. I can relate to that. Jonah was called to proclaim the message of God, and he didn't want to. And he even did it to the bare minimum, and God acted, and the people responded, and the results were divine. They didn't belong to Jonah. The message we're called to proclaim belongs to God, not to us. And even reluctantly, we can share that message. In the gospel lesson today, Jesus shares the first words in the gospel of Luke. And it says that he came to proclaim the good news of God. And he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. It's basically the same message that God was asking Jonah to share Repent and believe in the good news. And then he goes and he finds uh, Simon and Andrew, and he's like, guys, let me teach you how to fish for people. Follow me. And what do they do? They go right away. They drop their nets and they go. He goes to James and John. Will you follow me? They, they leave their father, their inheritance, their livelihood to follow Jesus. Now, it's one thing if God's calling us, we're probably going to drop everything immediately and go. But it's another thing if God's going to use us to proclaim this message. What will we proclaim? Will we proclaim the good news that God has given us? Or will we proclaim ourself? I'll tell you, when we proclaim ourself, we end up making a fool of ourselves in a gym lobby. <laughs> Friday morning, I drove up to the gym. I found the woman. And I walked over toward her. And she did this. <laughs> She saw me coming and did not want anything to do with me. And I said, may I talk to you, please? She doesn't know who I am. She doesn't know what I do for a living. Thank you. <laughs> and I walked up and I said, my name is Steve. And I was very rude to you. You didn't deserve that. I got mad and I took it out on you. That wasn't fair. I'm sorry. And I would love to tell you that she came around the desk and gave me a hug. <laughs> and we're besties. No, that didn't happen. That didn't happen at all. She just looked at me and says, okay. And uh, I said, thank you for letting me share that with you. And I, I got up and left. What I do know is this, is that we've all been given a message. 
And we have to be very careful with it because we, at all times, are proclaiming something with everything that we say and everything that we do and everything that we think. We have the opportunity today to let that be a message of God. Or it can be us. And we do it all the time. So maybe today we can try to practice proclaiming God, the good news that God has given us. After all, this is Abiding Presence Lutheran Church where we seek God and serve others. Let's serve them by proclaiming the good news. Amen.